Right, Robbie, thank you very much for giving us your time for Monday Night Football. Uh, if it's okay with you, we'll start with this season. Mm-hmm. We may not touch on this season quite as much as it justifies because it's been a, a rip roaring success, but it's also been covered a lot over the last three yeah. weeks because we had the title wrapped up so quickly. So, to start on this season, a lot of people believe that a team learns more in defeat than in victory. Is that a theory you subscribe to? And if so, how difficult has it been this season to ensure that the players were still learning and growing in those long winning and unbeaten runs? Well, I think I think winning for a start breeds confidence and breeds uh, development of players as well. You know, I think it's great to go on winning runs because the players, you know, they have confidence and they believe in what you're doing and they try different things and they, you know, they'll do things in the pitch that they maybe wouldn't do if they were on a losing streak. So I think, you know. Best way it develops to win games, you know it certainly is. Uh, but losing games as well is, uh, yeah, you learn a lot from what you do. You know, you you learn a lot about the characters you've got in the change room. You know, you learn a lot about how people handle pressure, how they handle bigger games, and how they handle expectations as well. And you know, from a managerial side as opposed to a coaching side, then from the defeats you learn a lot. I say about character. Coaching side, you would prefer to win all the time. You know, because. That breeds confidence in your own uh, beliefs and the, the players' beliefs in you. But you know we've been lucky enough to go on a lot of winning streaks, and the, the last few weeks have been difficult, and we've lost a few games. But you know nothing's changed here at all, as in you know, the way we go about things, the way we handle the players, or the way we coach the players. You know we see it more as a long-term goal as opposed to just you know reacting to what happened on a Saturday, because we're going to up next season. And, you know, we've all go on losing streaks. You know we'll lose a couple of games in the bounce. So, you know, might not win as many games as we'd like to and you know, have to be ready for that as well. From a fan's perspective, the fact that we've won so often suggests that you've taken a management like a duck to water, but I'm guessing it's not been quite as effortless as it's maybe seemed from the outside. What's the biggest lesson or lessons that you've learned over the course of this uh, season? The biggest lesson for me is preparation of what you're going to do. You know, I, I prepare most of the stuff for a week on a Sunday, you know, so... The players will come in Sunday morning, I'll spend the rest of Sunday and then the players are off Monday and I'll, I'll continue doing the video stuff on the Monday, so it means that when I come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I know exactly what I'm going to be doing, the staff know exactly what we're going to do, you know, we know what we're talking about and all the things we're going to do uh, throughout the week and up to the Saturday, so, you know, preparation is, for me, the biggest part of it. You know, you, ha- you have to believe in what you're doing, you know, when you get to training ground and if you're prepared and you know exactly what you're going to go and talk about, then the players will buy into it as well you know if you get there and you know it's half measures and you don't really know what you're doing or you're not quite 100 sure about the things that you want to talk about then you know within 10 seconds the players know that you're, you don't believe in it so you know you have to be prepared i spent you know once i got the role last 18 i think it was i spent the whole summer putting together the whole pre-season program about what we do every single day you know every minute every day uh, on the training field morning and afternoon so that i knew that you know because a young coach coming into a, a big club like this, the players will judge you right away. You know, and if you're not prepared for it, and if the training's not prepared and it's not good, then then they'll lose faith in you right away. You know, so I spent my whole summer doing that. So that first day of training, I knew exactly what I was doing. The last day of pre-season, I knew exactly what I was doing, and I've just carried that right through. You know, Steve and Jack are great helps in that. You know, I'll put the stuff together, and they'll go and set it up outside. You know, they go in the morning, I'll have my meeting with the team, and my go out, it's all ready to go, and then they help me take bits and bobs and. Steve does a lot of the strikers, Jack the midfielders, and you know I think it, it's uh, you know going back. You have to be prepared. That's it. End of the day, if you're not prepared, then you'll you know be successful. Is it hugely different than your role last season with under twenties? Uh, how many of the skills did you find to be transferable between the two? Uh, I think uh, it's similar in a way. The training side of it's similar. You know, similar out in the pitch, similar things I was working on and trying to develop players. And you know, when you're in a training pitch. It doesn't matter if you're taking under tens or you're taking you know, first team players, it's the same, you know, same dimensions, same ball you use, same things you talk about, maybe a bit more detail with older players, but you know, the the, the different side of it for me was, you know, managing players, managing the media, managing, you know, dealing with the directors, the board, you know, the director of football and the medical staff, the doctors, you know, everything, you know, kit man, everything comes to me and I make decisions on it all the time so that's been the probably the, the, the most uh, difficult thing to deal with in that side of it. Did it help you uh, in terms of you know transferring it in a new position that 
we were in a position where the first team squad was particularly young so there was actually a continuation of some of the guys that you were working with from last season did that age your transition? Oh massively it did you know I'd, I'd worked with a lot of players in the 20s you know a lot of them King even Walker Nicholson Holt Oliver Hamilton loads of the guys Patterson had come and played for me as well Carrick so I'd worked with loads of them the season before the we had a big transition of players as well. You know, we moved I think twelve of them on, but all fourteen in, which then allowed me to, you know, keep the guys I wanted to keep. It allowed me to recruit the way I wanted to, you know, if, the way I wanted to train, the way I wanted to do double and triple sessions. I knew that I had to bring the right people in to do it. And you know, younger players will buy into it anyway. You know, they do a few if you're a head coach and you tell a young player hey, that this is what we're gonna do, then they'll do it because they want to progress, they want to please, they want to do the right things with us bringing an older player it can be more difficult because they're set in their way so you know when recruitment wise the first thing I said to them when they came in I had a print out of the week schedule and I said to them look this is what we're going to do I said, it's up to you if you want to do it or not I had a couple of players that didn't want to do it and they, we didn't sign and it had to be like that because what I couldn't do is sign a player and then the first day of pre-season I say right we're doing triple session today and said no I'm not doing it you know, and then you've lost them for the season so yeah it had to it, it was a a big positive for me that I got the role in the position that we were in and that I could alter the squad and, and bring the right people in. So we've discussed there with the, <coughs> the youngsters that you know a positive was that you potentially knew what to expect or had an idea of what to expect but has there been anything or any individuals in particular that have surprised you this season? Probably all of them to be honest with you, you know, at the start of the season if we're all being honest as Hearts fans we'd have probably looked at and said Look, let's just get promoted doesn't matter how we do it, we'll take a place in the playoffs and we'll get promoted that way. You know, if we'd said to the fans, right, we're going to win the league, I think they'd have taken a victory in the last day of the season to win it, you know, and to have won it the way we have, you know, pretty convincingly, with <coughs> seven games to go and, you know, setting records all over the place here and there and, you know, players playing out their skin, I think every one of them's surpassed the expectations I had for them anyway. And, you know, a big challenge will be doing it again next year. It seems a, a daft question after such a tremendous season, but knowing that a few of the people involved at the club at the moment are perfectionists, you could say, I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you got any regrets from this season? Is there anything that you feel could have gone better? Yeah, you know, there's, you know, I wouldn't say regrets, you know, the, the position we're in, then there's no point having regrets. You know, if you, if you have regrets, then if you've done things differently, when you've been in the situation we're just now, but there are certain things that we've done through the season, you know, that probably could have done differently you know, and setting teams up tactically and making changes then, you know, you, you, every game you, you look at, it doesn't matter if you've won 5 now or you get beat 5 now, you can always say, well, what if I've done that, should I done that, we went better in. You know, I think you always have to. The hardest, probably the hardest thing to do is when you've had a victory is to look back again and say, probably should have done that and done this, but we've had to do it. You know, when you, you get a defeat and you always look back at yourself and think, you know, could have done something differently as a coach. And, you know, I'd say nine times out of ten then you probably put a cuda. How difficult is it, I suppose, you know, of course the under twenties games are always important, but they're more about developing individuals to be ready in a couple of years' time. How difficult is it when you're losing a first team game as a manager, not to take that all on and really let it affect your your know your mentality going forward? Yes. It, it, it can be difficult and, and you know we've had a couple of <coughs> disappointing results and defeats especially in the derby and then going to I Ibrox as well and you know I think you have to reflect and you have to be down you know we were disappointed in our performance but you know you have a day after it thinking about it you know worrying about it and decide what you could have done wrong and then it's time to move on again you know the next game's coming up you need to win the next one and thankfully we've done that after defeat you know we've moved on to the next game we've won it and you know I have to be positive about here I have to make sure I'm not going to put my face trip me you know, yes, I might be disappointed about a result or a performance or a decision I've made, but it's done. You know, and football just moves on all the time. You know, you can't stand here and, and worry about something we've done three weeks ago. You know, the next game is the most important. It's almost as if you knew my next question, Robert. <laughs> Let's move on to the summer then. So there've been a couple of decisions so far that have been that have, that you've taken or mm -hmm. the club have taken that have taken some supporters by surprise, and there will likely be a few more, I suppose, before the summer's out. Do you hope that your achievements this season have earned you the benefit of the doubt with supporters or will you simply have to prove yourself all over again next season? Yeah, I think you need to prove yourself again, that's it. As players and as a coaching staff, we need to prove ourselves again. We're moving up to a bigger level and, you know, we've 
Yeah, we've had a great season, but it's a championship. You know, it's at the end of the day, we've won the championship, but we're going to be the top league. Man. You know, so I'm going to play in big games every week. You know, against good players, against good coaching staffs, and you know, it's another battle for us and another mm. uh, challenge. It is. You know, we have to go up there and prove that we can handle it in, a, in the top league. As a player, you saw probably hundreds of colleagues come and go during your time at Hearts. It was particularly chaotic for a couple of years in the middle there. Uh, but you also witnessed the special bond that Hearts fans have with those players, especially the foreign guys that come in or guys that come from, you know, turn up here out of nowhere. And sometimes instantly there's a bond. That Rudy's obviously the most, mm-hmm. you know, the easiest example uh, of he still has that relationship now with, with Hearts supporters. Because of that, the fans tend to get particularly emotional when their heroes depart. Is that something that the Hearts fans are going to have to rethink, given the normal tenure of players nowadays is a year to two years maximum sometimes? No, I think you, you just have to enjoy the players where we have them, whether it's a form player, whether it's a young player. You know, we've got guys coming through and out, made it into the first team, and you know, homegrown Scottish players that have come right through the academy. And, you know, I don't see them staying here for 10 years or 15 years. I see them staying here for another two years, three at the most, and then they move on. So, you know, I think that every player we just have to enjoy the time we've got with them. You know, and talking about the foreign players come in, there's a certain type, I think, that come in that, you know, they can handle the mentality of playing at Hearts. You know, there's a lot of players that come in and they can do it in other leagues, you know, sometimes bigger leagues. But coming to Hearts is a difficult place to play with the venue and the expectations and you know, you always find, and I've felt that the stronger characters handle it more. You know, Rudy Scatcho is a strong character. You know, Ali Moss touch coming this season is a strong character. You know, guys that they can handle the expectations, and you know, when, when we recruit, but that's what we look for. We look for guys that can lead and can can take that. You spoke there about how short even the you know the careers of the youngsters may be at hearts. How difficult is that going to be for you moving forward to manage that each summer so that it's a transition rather than every year it feels like ripping it up and starting the game from scratch? <coughs> no, but I think I think that's what most Scottish teams are doing nowadays. You know, you look at you know the majority of teams that are in the SPL probably lose 12, 14 players in the summer, mm-hmm. and it's the nature of the football and that you know a lot of teams or players will sign one-year contracts. You know, whether it be in the players' decision because he's looking to get a good season and move somewhere better or whether it's a club's uh, decision where it's you know taking a chance on somebody so you know it's just part of football nowadays that you know you you bring guys in and sometimes they'll do do your turn for a year and then they move on sometimes it doesn't work out and then they move on so you know there's very few four and five year contracts getting handed out in Scotland nowadays mm-hmm. you know it's all a year two years probably the most or even six months at times because we don't have the we don't have the money to gamble on people, and that's the problem. You know, we can't be like doing England where they say right, it'll get a three or four year deal, and then six months later it's not worked out, and they pay them off. You know, it doesn't happen up here. You know, and also the players aren't getting big money, so they see it as an opportunity to come in, do well for a year, and then take another step up where they get, you know, doing England you can get double, triple, quadruple times your money. There is as. You mentioned there, and as we touched on when we were talking about the fans, you know, getting emotionally involved in it, there is more and more a move in general terms towards this idea that football's business and we have to be a wee bit hard, more hard nosed about it. Players will come, they'll do a job, and they'll go. How difficult has that been for you personally, though? I mean, if any of those discussions with players where you know they're maybe expecting to be kept on, and you know that that's not going to happen, has that been difficult for you? You know, has that weighed on you, knowing that you're going to have to break that news to players that they're not going to get to stay when they possibly want to? Yeah, it's always difficult. Right? It's always difficult to speak to players when they're, they're hoping that they're going to stay at a club like this, and you know, and, uh, and I have to make a decision. But the one that tells them that it's not going to be, but you know, it's that's part of life. You know, it happens in every era walk of life as well it's just in football it's a bit more publicised you know probably the hardest one to speak to is the younger kids you know I've like, mm-hmm. I did it last year but when I was the development manager with the younger ones and that's harder than telling a you know a 30 year old that he's not going to contract because a 30 year old will have options you know he can go in a club you know especially come from Hearts will sign these guys will sign for big clubs as well whereas if you're, you're letting a young kid go at 16, 17, 18 they've got nothing nothing to fall back on no CV you know, no background or anything, so they're the hard ones to do. And yes, it's no nice, but at the end of the day, it's, it's probably the best thing for the player. From the outside, I think there's been, uh, as we've said, there's been some reaction that it seems particularly harsh after the season we've had, and the fact that none of the players that will leave have necessarily had bad seasons at all. 
but is that actually a, a does that make it easier for you it's more positive in that well you've had a great shot window for the last year you will move on to bigger and better things because you've played well it's not off the back of getting no game time or you know or struggling for the season most of these guys have performed which will mean they'll go into a better position than they would have been had they been languishing yeah, so much as like, you know the guys that came in the summer uh, last summer and they're leaving this summer you know it's been a win-win for everyone mm-hmm. you know we brought them in they've done great for us they've won us the league you know and performed really well but they've also came with game time you know, if their CVs went up they're you know, there's clubs after players now, you know, even guys that are still on contract, there's, there's clubs after them with us, you know, so everyone's stocks went up, but, you know, I have to make a decision in the summer what I think the level is that we need to get to, and if I believe I, I need to make changes to it, then I have to, because what I can do is, you know, yeah, we've had a great season in the Championship, keep everyone together and don't add to the squad, and it comes October, November next season, and we're down the bottom of the league and we start panicking about, you know, having to get players in and players out, you know, this is the time to do it, and you know, we make a decision about where I want to be I and mean, I know where I want the team to be and where I think we can get it to but you know, the players we have at the moment we need more On to the more positive side of the summer then and I'm not expecting any names here but in general terms what can we expect from the players that you hope to bring in? A little, you know you want to add you know, value for money you want to add guys that are going to come and, and you know, perform for the club you know, and hopefully get us as high out of the league as we can be good characters you know, we spent the last two or three months, you know, probably before that in January time, even when we were, looking, when we were recruiting, uh, you know, players in January, we had an eye towards the summer about who we're going to try and get in. And recently, we've really stepped up a level. You know, with you know, having players watched, I've been watching players. I'll be going up next week to go and look at players in Europe. You know, and it's important that we get the right guys that are coming in. And it, it takes time. It will, you know, but I think the guys we get in, I hope, will take us to the level we want to get to. How do you gauge the character of a new signer? Is it mainly word of mouth from people <coughs> who have worked with them previously? Yeah, well, if I can't meet them personally, you know, I like to try and meet them. And then you know, when you speak to somebody, you get an idea of what they like. But you know, I always speak to people that I know in that country. You know, there's always, you know, there's always somebody I know that I've, I know directly, or I know indirectly through someone else that I trust. You know, that I know the character of them, and you know, they can do a bit of homework to speak to people they know, and you know, give you an idea of what the person's like. Do you have an idea in your head, maybe formed from your playing days? I'm almost thinking of like a boy band manager here, <laughs> where you've got this manufactured idea of we need, you know, these different types to make up a successful boy band that will sell records. <laughs> yeah, so we need the one, you know, the one that thirteen-year-old girls are like, and that kind of thing. Do you have an idea in terms of your squad? As we need a couple of jokers, you know, we need a couple of more sensible, more experienced heads. Have you almost got roles in the squad that you're looking to tick off? Yeah, or, yeah we are. That's 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 it exactly. You know, no so much the boy band <laughs> well with your style same so you fit in perfectly as the older one <laughs> pull my trousers a wee bit like we, um, you know you, you always get an idea about how you want your team to play and what you want to be like and you know there is it, you know, it, it's a balance night between you know we, we're realistic we're not going to get you know if we're looking for a centre half we're not going to get a guy who's six foot four quick great on the ball great character you know a winner you know, I'm not going to get him because if he's got all those attributes, he's playing the Premiership and he's on you know, 50,000 a week. You know, so we have to try and balance it out where it'd be, you know, maybe not quite as good at this thing and better at that. And it's trying to merge it into the rest of the team. You know, I know what I want in the centre half, I know what I want in the left by a midfielder, strikers as well. And it's important you have all different types of characters. And, you know, the reason we went and got Gennaro in, in January was that, you know, we needed a different type of player. We needed somebody who was physical and could give us a link up top. Whereas we had <coughs> Osmond So who gives us a pace, with James Keaton who gives us you know, a bit of guile in the box. You know, Carrick who unfortunately was English gives us pace, Sufi and dropping in. You know, so you're looking to get all different types of players so that you know if we're playing a game on Saturday and it's maybe not working the way we thought it would work and we have to change the personnel to give us something different then we're able to do it. We're going to go on to talk a wee bit about your, your football and philosophy, but that brings up an interesting point there because that, I think, starts to give a wee indication as to your general approach to it. A lot of managers wouldn't necessarily go with the tactic that you've spoken about there, having a different option. They would prefer and more have identical replacements. So we've got choice A, who does those things, and he's our first choice, and then we've got, so we don't have to change the rest of the shape. Mm-hmm. If he's injured, we've then got someone who's just does the same things as him but slightly less well. 
is there a reason that you you know have gone for that squad of all the different options rather than having one specific system where you've got you know A and B who do the same things I think you know, you have to football is about winning that's it and a lot of times when you play the games you have an idea of how you think the game's going to go and then it doesn't turn out that way and you have to be able to change it you know and the best way to change it is to you know, change the direction of it by bringing somebody else in that, that offers something different and you know I understand some coaches that just play the same way all the time you know but you know you have to change you have to I, I believe you need to be able to change the way you play and the system you play as well because you know you get found out you know everyone watches videos or games they've done ours you get wise scout you know I could sit here, you know, and watch we play Cowden Meath and Saturday, I could sit and watch, you know, twenty videos of our last twenty games. You know, and if you continue to do the same things all the time then, you know, people will find a flaw in it and they'll be able to exploit it. So you have to have, you know, different ways of playing the game and different ideas about how you're going to win that game. On formations then, I was recently told that we are obsessed with systems and shape on our show. I had to put it down as being the football manager generation, <laughs> where we've been fiddling about with them for hours on end during our childhood. Uh, it's something that we've seen yourself change on a regular basis this season as well. Do you have a preferred formation? Um, you know, all things being well, is there one way that you would like to be able to approach every game? First and foremost, I, I want to win the game, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, if I feel that I, I need to change the system, the way we're going to play, then I'll try and do it, you know. So, for me, there's only really, there's only two different systems, really, I think. You either play three at the back or four at the back, and everything else is just really, you know, five yards here or five yards there, mm -hmm. different personnel. You know, when you go for three in, the, three in the back, it changes the whole dynamic of the game. And, you know, you have to have the right type of players to play it. You know, you play the damn winner. You know, most people would, you would, think playing three centre halves is the best way to do it in there but I, f I feel that you know two outside centre halves have to be mobile enough to play, yeah. play the channels and be comfortable in those positions so you know we ended up playing with Kevin McCarrick because I felt we'd be more comfortable in that position before we changed it and to play a three you have to have the right personnel to do it and, you know you watch Juventus they played it for years and they had the right personnel you know the wing back that could go on down the other side as well two outside centre halves were really mobile you know quick squeezed the game made it difficult for people and a preferred system you know this season we've been playing 4-2-3-1 a lot of the time before the season started I, I was going to play 4-4-2 you know that's what we looked at because we felt that you know the, the defence we were playing against we'd be able to exploit them with two people up front mm -hmm. but as the season, the season progressed a little bit I can alter it and ended up playing 4-2-3-1 because we had the players that I felt would cause teams more damage behind the striker so we ended up playing a, a single striker and the main attacking threat was the three guys that played behind the striker and they went two sitters that protected us from that so you know going up next season you know I'd like to be able to play two or three different, different systems well you know, whether that be three to back or whether it be four you know, I, I, in, a, in a purely theoretical world I would like to play three four three I think that's a great system to play but you have to have you have to be able to dominate the game you have to have the best players to play you have to you, know, you have to have two centre midfielders that, are, that can cover the whole area mm -hmm. You, know, you have to have a striker that can lead the line yourself. You have to have two outside centre halves that can work the channels and are quick and powerful and dominate in the wide areas. Uh, you need to have two your wide four who need to be mobile to get them done. So I don't think we'll be playing it next season. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was <laughs> one of a bigger budget. <laughs> so the most the most obvious example of that this season in British football then uh -huh. is probably Liverpool that yeah. have actually implemented that three four three system. Well, you, well, you look at Liverpool and they they play that, but they play they, you know you watch different systems yeah. play. I went down to Liverpool and I had a meeting with Brendan and, and we spoke about different things and he was talking about they played like a box you know, if you, they played like a, a box in the midfield there was like two and two sitting in front mm -hmm. and you know, they rotated and they, they, they got this 3-5-2 from a th the, that box system with a three and, and it was more a, it was like a four and then a two and then a one I think it was mm -hmm. if I remember but he got it from playing against Bal they played Bal away and yeah. they, they played a different formation <coughs> and he, he realised second half he figured it out and he's, he's what a good system it was and he started playing it and, and that's worked well for him and uh, it's always you know. how AK Athens played when they came I remember that it was, all, it was Emerson in the mid, middle and mm -hmm. someone else and it was everyone just playing through them and everyone was kind of like circling them at some point mm -hmm. but you uh, playing that box and you just rotate around yeah. the box you know, and it also gives you you, know, you you get two people who sit and defend cover it and you get two people in front who you know playing behind a strike and can make runs in between you know, but then you need people on the outside that are mobile enough to cover that whole area is that something then uh, Taking the Brendan Rodgers example there, that he's learnt from a team in Europe, you know, a different style of football, but he's realised we can utilise that in 
British football maybe people wouldn't expect it they mm-hmm. didn't come up against it every week slightly different for us in the situation that we're in but is that something that excites you about next season getting a slightly higher level maybe you know more experienced coaches at least who are maybe able to implement their ideas a wee bit better and you can test yourself against that maybe pick up wee hints and tips as we go through the season yeah I think definitely I think you know the the higher up you go in, in football you know the more patterns there are in the game you know you can actually see things getting built and you can see what the coaches are working on you know sometimes you, you, know, you play against teams in, in the lower leagues and it's, yeah, it's pretty basic and pretty route one you know they'll get the ball or the keeper will kick out the park and then it's just wanting off setting balls and it's difficult to actually you know, work on it and to you know, try and maybe lull them out or try and do different things you know we spent a, a lot of our games this season at Tynecastle we we decided to sit in a wee bit, you know. We sat in against a lot of times when they were here and a couple of other teams as well, you know, because we knew that they would they would come in and would sit in, you know, make it difficult. And when teams sit in, it's really hard to break down. So eventually we, we gave up a lot of possession and just let them have it. We sat in and we ended up being a team that sat deep, mm-hmm. you know, and then when we won it, there was a big area for us to go running because we get pace of, you know, Solo, Nicholson, King, guys like that. They can go breaking. It, it's know, almost so. that idea of giving them enough rope to hang themselves, drawing exactly them out, as you know, leave spaces, you know, the and then exploit. The amount of times that we, you know, we allowed centre halves to have the ball and they made try to make a pass in the midfield and we won it and we went out apart and broke yeah. and scored was, you know, it was it happened loads. You know, it happened. It might have been the first goal against County Beath, I think. You know, I watched it earlier on the day. <laughs> we centre half tried to play in the midfield. We were sitting deep and we won it and we went broke and scored the goal because those are the situations I suppose where they can possibly train for that you know they can account for losing the ball in certain areas but not at full speed not with our personnel you know That's moving easy, towards yeah. them whereas they can train 10 men behind the ball mm-hmm. sitting on the edge of the 18 yard box it's true you know it's, it's a different tactic and you have to use because it it's easy to set your team up and just say right we're going to go 4-5-1 or 5-4-1 and some of the times you just put everyone behind the ball and it's really hard to break them you know, and if you if you just continually do the same thing, try to break them down and break them down, and they start getting a bit of confidence because they think well, they're not going to score against us, and then we start overcommitting. We did it again at the start of the season when we drew 0 0. Yeah. You know, we, they, they sat in, we kept going, and we kept going, and we ended up losing our shape because our two midfielders were thinking, well, maybe score, and I'm going to go and try and score. And we ended up with two centre halves against their two strikers yeah. and with everyone else in the box attacking it instead of. You know, having a bit of shape where we just continue getting the ball in and out and in and out till we score and ended up we probably should have lost that game that day because there were a couple of ropey moments ah, towards the end, the end, you know, <coughs> end you know when they got a ball across the face and mm-hmm. the wee boy oh, I can't remember his name the striker <laughs> missed it the open goal you know when it came yeah. across ok uh, well we're, we're aware that as we've spoken about with systems football evolves all the time it's constantly evolving and you have to react to that but at the club at the moment we're also aware through yourself and Craig that there's now a distinct philosophy moving forward in terms of the way that coaches will progress through the club what will happen you know as and when yourself moves on uh, to bigger and better things but at this moment in time what are the key elements to your personal football and philosophy? Uh, keeping the ball keeping it for a purpose you know we speak about possession for a purpose you know what we don't want to do is become a team that just passes around for the sake of passing mm-hmm. you know we have to be, we look to keep the ball until the opportunity is on and then make the pass you know and if it and I was well when I speak to the players about it I would rather they took an opportunity to go and do it than miss the opportunity and if it doesn't come off it doesn't come off you know that's why we you know we train a lot on the defensive side of it you know we spoke at the start of the start of the season that you know, we, we didn't speak about how many goals we were going to score, we spoke about how few we were going to lose. You know, we said if a decision between us all that if we lost less than 25 goals in the season, we would win the league. And that's what the whole setup was based on. You know, being solid, being strong in defence and making sure we were nice and stable and then allowing the Nicholsons and the Walkers and the Kings and the Keatons to go and score the goals for us. And then, you know, we have to we've always got a shape about us, you know, if you notice we always have, you know, generally we have two centre halves and two centre midfielders, you know, and that's the, the block we play from. And we keep the ball side to side and then when the opportunity comes, it's up to the player to make the right decision to go in. Where he makes a pass and if he doesn't then it comes in over the other side. Does playing possession football like that at times sometimes require a change to the Scottish mentality almost where you know a lot of the time you maybe catch a player in a game and it all seems to be about 
I need to do something that creates a goal mm-hmm. or that can directly lead to a goal. And some people seem to fail to understand how a sideways pass can, in theory, lead to a goal. And that it might not be an assist itself, but it might be the pass before the assist or this, you know, two passes before the assist. Does that, did that require some explaining to the players in terms of it may not look like we're progressing forward all the time, but in actual fact, we are. We're just doing it in a subtler way. Yeah, I think it's... I, I, we keep possession side to side, but you know, it, I get frustrated sometimes if we do it and we overdo it. Mm-hmm. And the reason we do it from side to side is until we get a gap in. If we get it, if we move it side to side three or four times and then the gap opens up and we don't take it, then it's frustrating for everyone, you know, because that's the reason we move it side to side. Mm-hmm. And that's why when it comes to that area and it's on, we have to take a chance and go and play it. You know, and at times it works, at times it doesn't work. But, you know, there's, there's loads of stats and you know, again spoke to the boys at the start of the season about it, but you know how many times the, the ball transfers position possession in the game. There was a stat on about you know, I think it was the top five or ten leagues in Europe and they counted it and how many times do you think the ball transfers possession in the game? How many? <laughs> but as in how many times someone's dispossessed yeah, another team goes from one team to another. Oh, you would think a lot if you're including throw ins and set pieces and things like that. Hundred, four hundred. Yes, that's what I suppose that was. It was just even more than you unbelievable. Think. Why you wouldn't think mm-hmm. it? You know, it's going for one team or not. Yeah, it goes about four hundred times in a game. You know, I was thinking of Pep Guardiola's team. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, so it, it's always changing all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and the, and the game breaks up all the time. But that's why it's important that we try and keep possession. And then, you know, if they give it away, then so what? You know, I mean, if you keep it yeah. for ten passes mm-hmm. and then make the pass, then so what? You know that. Eventually we're going to get away anyway, whether it's by a goal when the other team gets possession or whether we put it for a goal kick, you know, whether it's a throw-in. So, have to take the chance, you know, go and rattle into somebody and a striker and then you think it's going to get something. But, you know, the best players make the best decisions about, you know, when it's on and when it's not on. You know, you, Zidane, remember Alex Ferguson, you probably heard it talking about, you know, he does everything simple. You know, people think he, every, every time he touches the ball, it's a, the best, you know, thing in the world, and he's always making killer passes, and he's always taking people on and setting up goals. But if you watch a game, now, you know, everything it does is really simple. You know, it's just passing it here and passing it there, and then maybe once or twice in a game, he makes a killer pass and he makes a right decision, and that's what everyone remembers him for. You know, whereas it, you know, the younger players and you know, in Scotland everywhere, you know, it's always about every time you get the boy thing, I need to make that killer pass. I need to be the one that mm-hmm. does that right there. But it's it's making a decision about when's the right time to do it and when's the not the right time to do it and you know, as we try and coach and keep the ball side to side and move it into the air. If it goes back to the keeper then fair enough. But we keep it but then once it's on, then they make a decision about when it goes in. I want a slightly more personal thing then in terms of the way that the club works at the moment. Uh, well yourself and Craig and Anne Hearts have been looked at as a really progressive club in many respects at the moment. But one small thing I've noticed that goes against the expectation of the way football is, uh, particularly in Scotland, is that, and we noticed that on Sunday, the players call you Robbie quite a lot of time. Are the days of Gaffer and Boss now gone, or is it just de- still dependent on the type of character that's that's in place as manager? Yeah, that's, that was a funny thing, because right? I was like, in the summer, I was saying to myself, no. Most in football in Scotland, most of the time, the manager, the head coach is called Gaffer. Mm-hmm. You know, if they want to call, I said to him, if you want to call me Gaffer, you can call me Gaffer. I didn't bother me. Call me Robbie if you want to call me. I'd prefer to be called Robbie because that's my name at the end of the day. You know, and I'm still the same person I was before I get the job. You know, the same person after as well. And you know, whether somebody calls you Robbie or whether they calls you Coach or whether they calls you Gaffer, you know, for me, as long as they respect you, then that's it. You know, and. Just because somebody calls you gaffer doesn't mean they're going to respect you, you know. So I would rather just call, call me what they feel comfortable with. You know, I'm more comfortable with people calling me Robbie. You know, I prefer the staff call me Robbie. Sometimes people call me gaffer and I don't really like it, to be honest with you, because mm-hmm. I look for somebody else over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> but they, you know, it's entirely up to them, you know what I do. You know, I prefer them called Robbie. Do you think that's down to your age, or do you think it's down to you being more comfortable here in these surroundings and not feeling like you need to come in and stamp your authority here on things straight away? Why is it that you think you're comfortable with, you know, being on that level with players where some people would require that constant reassurance that I'm the boss in this situation? It's, you know, it's a, I don't know how you put it. 
you know, do you, do you, you're the manager at your work, you know, do you respect him more if you called him Gaffer, if you called him by his name? I would probably respect somebody more by calling him by name, as long as we then just call him Gaffer, you know, if you, you know, and, I, I respect the players we speak, you know, talk to each other, call them their name, they call them my name, and that's not really what I mean. At the end of the day, you know, you could be the, the worst coach in the world and they'll call you Gaffer, you know, or you could be a good coach and they call you by name, it doesn't really matter, it's here and there, you know, it's about, and it's about what you do out there, you know, and how you treat them as a person and how you respect them and how you look after them, that will gain you respect rather than just a name that gets called. On to yourself as a manager then, uh, which manager from your career do you think your style is closest to? And that's style of management, because we know you've got unparalleled fashion scene. <laughs> <laughs> Are you aware of that? <laughs> the fans are commenting on what you're wearing at the weekend. <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't say, I'm just myself, that's it. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's important that you be yourself when you deal with the players and you deal with everything else, you know, because if you don't then, eventually they'll find you, you know, that you're not that, that person. So, you know, I've always tried to take bits and balls with different managers. There's been managers who, you know, I thought were really good, and there's been other managers I thought were poor. And you know, you're trying to take the good things for the good guys and the, the, the bad things, you look at it and see how you would do it differently and how you wouldn't do that again. And you, know, you can only be yourself when you're doing it. So, you know, there's no point in me saying, look, like, I've had loads of good managers over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, Jim Jeffries, Craig, Shaba, eh, George, you know, it's hard to name but a few, you know, it's been this one loads well, here, you know it's like, and then down south I had Nigel Pearson, Sosa, Ericsson, Matt Warburton for a while when I was down there as well, and yeah, Tuesday when I was back up in Scotland, you know, so I probably would have one in the time the time of hearts, probably 15 or 16 managers in there and there are 6 or 7 after that as well, so, you know, if you try and mirror yourself on one person, then you're never going to be like them, you know, and you end up being kidding yourself and kidding everyone else on here as well, just being yourself and if it's successful and it does well then good, if it's not then... Do you ever have those moments where I think most of us as people have heard them, especially as we get a wee bit older and you'll say something and you'll think, where have I heard that before and then you realise, oh no I'm turning into my old man. (laughs) (laughs) Is there ever those moments where you think, that was exactly, you say something or you react a certain way or you get a wee bit angry or whatever and you think, that was exactly like an old manager would have reacted in that situation no, no, not really no sometimes I'll say things and you know when you're a manager or a head coach or whatever you, you, you sometimes you need to remember that everything I say to a player you know whether it be off the cuff or whether it be you know just in the passing mm-hmm. it means a lot to them yeah. you know so I need to be careful that sometimes I have my, my players head still on you know where it might be you know, if had boys are having a wee bit of banner or something, then I'll have a bit of banner with them as well. And, and, and you look back and you think, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, because you know I mean? it can affect somebody in a way that, as a player, I wouldn't be bored, you know what I mean? Because it's just it's just a group environment. When you're a head, a head coach, you know, you have to be careful that everything you say gets taken on board. You know? That can be, at times, you need to bite your tongue, because you've got a, a witty remark that you want to get out there, and you, you think, oh, I can't say that, because I'm not going to say And you need to take a step back. But and by your question about is there something I've ever said that no, nah, not, not really, no, nah, no, nah, I've not really, you know, not that I can think of anyway. No doubt there probably is other things that people say I've heard that for. <laughs> <laughs> On that that kind of subject, in terms of the importance of what you say to players and stuff, there's a you're extremely young still to be in the position that you are, such a big club in Scottish football, all that kind of thing. But even just in terms of dressing room, you know, Neil Alexander is older than you. He is, you know, he is older than you. Is that, obviously you've got a particularly young squad, uh-huh. so that, there is still an age difference there that otherwise wouldn't necessarily be there, but is that an odd thing for you to be that young and in the dressing room as the boss, or is it just, it's been a completely logical transition in your yeah, career? It's felt quite natural for me, to be honest with you. As you know, like, even when I was a player, you know, I always felt, you know, I always try to look after the players, and I did always try to help them out, and, you know, and, and, to be honest, I would have rather set a goal up for somebody than score the goal myself. That was the kind of type of person I was, you know. Uh, that's why I never scored a lot of goals. By, uh, <laughs> oh, that's uh, why. <laughs> but I did always felt, you know, that I would prefer to help somebody else. You know, I think as a coach, especially nowadays, that's what coaching is about. You know, it's about trying to help people and progress them. You know, gone are the days where you just come in and shout at people and try and, you know, scare them or harangue them into doing something for you. You know, you have to try and make it 
that they make a decision. You know, when we do a lot of coaching out there, and you know, if there's aspects of the, the game that I'm trying to get across, then I'll ask them questions. What they think about it. You know, what do you think we should have done here? You know, what do you think we would have done here? What do the group think we should have done here? And then you end up getting, you know, a bit of conversation with them, and they'll say, "Well, I think about this." And if I don't agree, with it, I'll say, "Well, if you did this, we would definitely think that." Until we get it down to the avenue that I want to take it down, and then it ends up it's them that's made the decision. You know, instead of me saying, "No, you do that," and they go, "Well, I'm not really sure about that." So, you know, I think I think that's the way coaching is going. I do. I think that's why. There's a lot more younger coaches coming in because the, the mentality is of you know you can't just shout at people. You know, you shout at somebody there, they lose them. They just go right away, they just switch off and they're like no interest in you and end up losing them for two or three weeks. You know, whereas if you get them in and you speak to them and make them understand that you're trying to do it for a reason, you're trying to make them a better player, then, then they'll do it for you. You mentioned uh, you didn't score a lot of goals, obviously. But the penalty you took in the Gretna Cup final probably the best at the whole lot why why did you not uh, take more penalties or was it just the jammy jammy no, just on the bottom they, corner they always used to take them uh. Paul Hartley used to take them so I never really got uh, you want to go tell them, them to no, no, <laughs> but, like, you know, the, the cup final you know I would my players I would rather if I said who wants to take a penalty I would rather somebody put a hand up and missed it and then somebody just went no I'm not taking you need to put yourself up there to do it. You know? that, that's funnily something maybe just coming to now that we've noticed throughout the season that it seems to be every player who's, kind of, who's grabbing the ball first is trying to take the penalty. Um, this season, has there been a set, you know, like a one to three who's preferable for taking the penalty or is it just simply who wants to stick the hand up? Yeah, it's just who takes it. You know, we've never spoke about who takes the penalties, it's just who wants to take it. You know, and on the day, if you feel confident and take it, you know, there's never really been any issues. I think there was one about who wants to take it who didn't, you know, but. You know, I would rather that than you know guys just turn my back on it and rotating it. You know, it's important that you know they bit a bottle of it and miss players and say, no, take it if I miss it. I mean, I suppose that way then you've got maybe five or six confident players in the penalty shoot if it ever comes round. Yeah, it's, you know, you know, you want you want guys to be confident. And I've always, you know, to go back earlier on and talk about people making the pass and stuff. I would far rather somebody tried it and missed it and gave it away or made an error than not try it at all. You know, we'd. we'd Start the season, we, we did a lot of work before the season started about you know playing it for the back and trying to pass the ball and you know the mantra was you can do it and if you give it away and we lose a goal then okay you're not know, expected to lose five or six goals this season by you know a defender trying to pass it mm-hmm. each on in the ball way and somebody running through and scoring and you know, thankfully it's not happened you know, we lost goals that way but it will happen next season mm-hmm. but if I ask them to play a certain way then, then I need to ex- understand that they'll make mistakes. I suppose it all comes back to the idea that guys being willing to step up and take responsibility and that's what we've seen throughout the season. Had we not seen that then things wouldn't have gone anywhere near as well as they have but everyone's shown that level of bravery to take on that final ball or take on that shot at goal or you know whatever it may be, putting themselves under pressure and even in terms of you know, gathering the ball under under pressure and being willing to make that pass we see it all the time with more Gary Gomez game in game out that's one of his biggest things is he can take the ball with two or three men around him and be confident enough in himself to make the pass and move it on and that's then what exposes their defence and gets us on I suppose and that all comes through the whole philosophy or the whole mentality about the club that you know if you make a mistake then it doesn't matter you know we all make mistakes I make mistakes all the time you know the coaching staff do you know everyone does and you know Margaro we the first defeat we had at the season we played against Falkirk and Margaro made a mistake for the and then they t- tried to take the ball down they delayed he could made the pass and they delayed didn't make it got the ball taken off and it went and scored and you know, after the game and you know, I went and spoke to him and said to him I don't care they bomb me you know? because what I can't do is go in and say you know start having a go at people for that because the next time it comes and he brings it uh, it comes to him he just kicks it out of the park and then we don't get any of the passing we want. So the players realise that, you know, yes, we'll make mistakes, but they're no, never, ever, ever going to get punished for it. They're never, ever going to get shouted at for doing it. They don't get shouted at if they just get the ball and shell out of the park. And that's when they'll, they'll get shouted at because, you know, that's just, for me, that's a scaredness, you know, it's a, a fear of, you know, being the one that takes, makes a decision, being the one that, that does something different and, you know, helps the team. You know, I could still play if I just, I spent most of my career doing it, just shelling up the channel, you know, but uh, it never got us anywhere really, you know, as opposed to I would rather my players take the ball and try and pass it inside and give it away, and then they, 
we try and develop them for there. Okay, I've got one question left for the two reasons I'm going to wrap things up here. We could go on forever, but one, I'd quite like the opportunity to speak to you again, so we'll no hold you for too long <laughs> against your will. <laughs> Secondly, uh, I'm conscious of the fact that your phone rang right at the start of this interview and I didn't want us to be the guys who'd cost hearts James Milner on a free transfer. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was an ancient interview. <laughs> <laughs> so the final question for you then. If you could have one player in their prime in this current heart squad from all the guys that you played when your time at Hearts who would it be so no just in terms of who's the best player but who would be the best to manage who would fit in with this group of guys that kind of thing if you could take one player at their peak mm. who would it be difficult to <clears throat> that because there's not many good players at their peak you know obviously we had Paul Hartley who was fantastic for us with Rudy fantastic Stephen Presley, fantastic leader, you know, he's probably one that I would err towards and that you know, we'll look for a set of half now. Mm-hmm. Uh, see that long, there's that many of them, that's mm-hmm. the problem. I would probably say, you know, Tacky Faces for me was, you know, great character, great guy to have about, you know, not just as a player but as a person when he came, came to Hearts as he won the European Championships the year before, came from Benfica. And he came in and, you know, no ears and grace about him, just a, a good, honest guy and looked after everyone else, everyone liked him and, and top of that, he was a fantastic player. You know, so, I everyone will probably look at look and think, oh, we need to get strikers in and do that because he's the guy who changed, but a guy like Tacky was somebody that came and really brought everyone together. You know, and I, I, felt, I felt at the time he came in and he, you know, it was a great season we're having and one of the reasons was because we got him because he was very humble and you know nobody nobody got carried away about where they were as a team because the left back had just won the European Championships with Greece mm-hmm. and he was still out there running about working hard in the middle of December and January and putting a shift in and you know not getting carried away and you know it'd have been easy for a lot of players to think oh we're doing really well we're doing this and that and start you know getting carried away and think they've made it and yeah he was one that I think Probably his prime, I know he came here about 31, 32, but you know, if we'd got him about 28, if I'd get him at 28 now, I'd take him because it would be a real, you know, a real benefit to the whole club, not just the first team. Maurizio Pena seems to be just approaching his peak. Is there any chance yeah, of a chilling cool, playboy huh? making a comeback? <laughs> <laughs> we can lock, get lock him away. right now. Lock away your wives. <laughs> if, we, if we get um, Maurizio back then, we'll probably need to get some outside the casino to keep an eye on <laughs> <laughs> I'll volunteer for that, Joe. It was, in all honesty, it was phenomenal for little sparks and training mm-hmm. and games. Well, you we can see it now. Ah, you see, he was, he was phenomenal. We had a lot of issues in the background, you know, his family and Chile and coming over here and settling and things like that and you know he had uh, he enjoyed his life let's say that I think so but you see him now and that he's phenomenal you know mm-hmm. he's, he was stuck there was times out there you know in the training ground you're like oof what a player he is up at Pataudry probably the game mm-hmm. when he you know he was phenomenal that night and that was probably the one time in a football park for us that he did it and he got booked for the celebration as well didn't he got ended up getting sent off he was a good player that's why I'd forgotten about him (laughs) (laughs) well see if he's still dig a bit on your phone see if he's still got his number (laughs) he might might be due another crisis he might want to come back (laughs) well I'm sure there's numerous different characters that we can touch on in future Robbie if we ever get the chance to do this again but thank you very much for your time we really appreciate it thanks Robbie cheers guys